despite my Scottish accent, uh, my roots are in the adjoining counties, the Sligo in Mayo and Donegal, so I feel very much at home here and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I'm very pleased also to be talking to such a large number of people because uh, as many of you know I've been rabbiting on about climate change for about 40 years at this stage um, and there wasn't much in the way of excitement about it 40 years ago I can tell you but I'm so pleased now that the topic has entered if you like the mainstream of life of many people and uh, for that I'm afraid we can't take credit uh, in my generation because uh, my generation have let the world down if you like and really it's these people who we saw in our school and in our streets uh, over the past few months who have really grasped the nettle and uh, taken up the challenge of tackling what is the major problem of the world for the 21st century. And of course they have, as has been alluded to already, they've been energised by people uh, younger still, uh, the Greta Thunbergs of this world, um, who have uh, been so instrumental in galvanising people uh, as to the importance of taking action about this. And these are our leaders. These are our leaders. Our children and our grandchildren are going to be the people who will get us out of this pickle that we have let ourselves get into. I want to look at another lady for you that you don't know, and I'd like you to bear her in mind as we work our way through uh, the story today. And this is the lady I'm talking about. Um, because she hasn't got a name, she hasn't got the publicity that Greta has, but for her, climate change is very much a reality. It's a reality for her as she tries to collect her firewood each day, maybe having to walk further. Uh, it's a reality for her as she tries to feed her child, uh, and she tries sometimes also to, to grow crops to feed her family. So I want you to think about how climate change affects these unnamed people as we work our way through the topic uh, today as well. Now, um, of course, <coughs> we're looking at a problem which you all know very well, which is the problem of the earth getting warmer. And I just wanted to make a couple of points about that because we often hear about dangerous climate change, 2 degrees centigrade or 1.5 degrees centigrade. And it's important to remember that, that that hides a multitude of things. It hides the fact that we're looking at a global average for those figures. And if you drill down into where that average is based on, you can see that it's not universal. It's uh, very different, for example, uh, in areas uh, like the... Um, let me try and get that back. It's a very different in areas like the inner parts of our continents and very different uh, in the oceans from what it is in the, in the land masses. I don't think I can go back, so I'll just keep going. But what I wanted to show you was that, um, first of all, um, we're now about 1.1 degrees warmer than we were in pre-industrial times. And last year was the fourth warmest year on record um, since we had reliable instruments from about the middle of the 19th century. And the other three warmest years uh, were 2016, 15 and 17. So we're obviously living in very different and changed times. And if any of you are under 30 in the room today, well, during your lifetime, you've never experienced a month in which the average surface temperature of the earth was below the average for the entire 21st century. So when you look at this kind of a map, it's important to realise that when we talk about the future course of temperature, it's going to be very different in places in the interiors of continents than it is, for example, in the, in the oceans and even at the poles, where, again, it warms twice as quick for various reasons than the Earth as a whole. So those kind of things we have to bear in mind as we try to manage uh, climate change into the future. Now, we're very clear, I think, what's causing that to happen. Um, we know now that it's the changes in the atmosphere that we're causing. And this kind of jumping around graph here is a set of measurements of carbon dioxide that have been made from the South Pole, away over here, all the way to the North Pole, away over here, at various locations. We start in 1979 when the average CO2 concentration was about 336. And you can see as we work our way through the time scales up to the 80s and 90s and beyond, you can see how there's been a steady increase in concentrations at all those stations that we've been measuring the concentration at. You'll notice also that 
um, part of it is jumping more than the other part. This part in the northern hemisphere is much more volatile than the southern hemisphere. And that's reflected also in this sawtooth effect here because what you're looking at is the earth breathing in and breathing out really. You're looking at places in the northern hemisphere where plants grow, where leaves form on trees, <coughs> and where they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere during the summer months and then the, <coughs> then the leaves fall off the trees and the CO2 increases once again. And that's very different from the southern hemisphere, which is much more stable because, of course, the southern hemisphere is mostly ocean without plants growing uh, to give that same kind of an effect. But as you look through the, the trend here, you can see how reliable and how consistent it is all the way from that period of the 1970s all the way up uh, to the present day. And with more stations coming in uh, constantly, uh, you can see how the trend is, is confirmed here. And uh, you can see how now, by 10 years ago, it's beginning to approach 400 parts per million. And if we run the whole thing through, uh, we end up with a value today around about 410 or more parts per million. A very different situation from what it was in 1979. And even when we use earlier records, we get obviously less stations to rely on, but even if we use the more reliable ones from maybe the, the Hawaiian Islands here, you can see it confirms that trend as something that's been happening at least since 1960. And if we now use very ingenious, ingenious um, ways of measuring CO2 in tree rings and in our ice bubbles in the Antarctic ice sheets, you can see something happens around about 17, 1800 where the values settle down at about 280 parts per million. And that's what we call the pre-industrial level. So even when we push our records further back, uh, and we can go back now to about 2.7 million years or so, uh, we can see it never gets above that value of about 280 parts per million all the way back through history uh, for millions of years. So we've changed the atmosphere very much in the past few, in the past few decades alone. And uh, the ups and downs here, of course, are simply where we have glacials and interglacials coming in uh, and plants growing and then not growing and so on. But the important point is it's really a transformation of the atmosphere that we're looking at in this case. Now we can't see all of these problems, we can't see our carbon dioxide, but if we could, if we could capture it in a balloon, this is what a tonne of CO2 would look like. Um, now everyone in the room here produces about one of those balloons if you like, in terms of their impact, in terms of the actions that we take for our everyday life, we produce about one of those balloons every month. And that's our contribution to the greenhouse gas component of the atmosphere. Uh, we, as a country, uh, as, a, as a people, produce about 12.8 of those balloons every year, and we are about the third worst polluter in the EU. We're about 50% higher than the EU average for various reasons. And of course, if we were to look at those balloons piled up even for one day, and here they're piled up at the entrance to the mouth of the Liffey in Dublin, uh, we have 160,000 of them in Ireland for one day uh, piled up looking something like this. So, it's a problem we can't see, it's not like smoke, it's not like things that are very much more tangible that we're used to in terms of pollutants, but it's there nevertheless and it's quite substantial, uh, very much so. We now know that it's us, it's not nature, uh, it's not natural, uh, it's us that's producing that problem and the considered statement of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is that we are now in control of climate. Now, I, was, I grew up a lot in the west of Ireland and my grandfather used to talk about taking me out to save the hay. The hay wasn't always saved. Um, whether you did manage it or didn't manage it was at the mercy of the weather. People in Ireland were traditionally prisoners of climate. The world, indeed, is still, to some extent, a prisoner of weather. But now, things are reversing, and now the world's climate is a prisoner of what we do. A very different relationship that we have to come to terms with. And coming to terms with it has been difficult. We still have a lot of scepticism. Uh, and I wanted to show you a couple of things to, to urge you to be very careful about accepting what seem like plausible arguments. 
The first one, of course, is uh, when you see a trend, people will pick, a cherry pick, a bit of it and say, oh, look, temperature has been falling for the last 15 years. And they cherry pick carefully to start and finish in a way which seems to show that. But really, you have to look at the overall long-term trend and you see a very different picture uh, when that happens. So uh, be very careful about people using statistics to try and prove that the world is not warming. The other thing you have to be careful about is the difference between weather and climate. Weather is what we're getting outside today. Climate is a longer term average of those conditions, usually taken over 30 years. But for some, that difference is, is a wee bit uh, difficult to comprehend. And so you get some of the tabloid press here um, when we have a cold snap, for example, uh, saying, well, you know, uh, they still claim it's global warming, uh, the great climate change retreat. You have to be very careful about what you read in some of the press. Uh, and in particular, the tabloid press. And of course, if you are discerning at all, you'll ask yourself the question, would I believe a newspaper which inside is going to tell me how to stay healthy and avoid cancer? And at the same time, to help me do that, it's going to give me a free portion of chips. Um, so uh, again, you know, be responsible and be careful. Now, in Ireland, we, don't, we have a more responsible press and media than we do, uh, for example, in the UK. But we have our moments now and again, even here in Ireland. Just a couple of snippets here, one from the Irish Times, which is usually very good, but which, uh, you know, we had a cold snap in January 2010, you may remember. So we get this, um, uh, what's all that guff about global warming? You know, we get this kind of um, mixing up of weather and climate. Uh, columnists who like to be controversial, um, Kevin Myers here, never short of an opinion, as you, as you probably remember, um, doing another thing, which is mixing up different things and wrapping them all together. Here he's wrapping up climate, he's wrapping up Catholicism, warmism, and communism, all in the same kind of wrap, and uh, if you like, drawing the same common conclusion from them. And my own favourite down here, from Ruth Dudley Edwards, who's a very good historian, but not a very good climate scientist, I have to say, accusing myself of getting excited about something. Now, at my stage in life, that's a real compliment, um, and I, I take it as such. But I'm just trying to get you to be careful about what you read, because it's quite important. Because irrespective of whether you believe thermometers or not, and thermometers are things you can't argue with, nature is telling us very clearly that things are changing very radically. Um, we know, for example, that the, uh, the ice sheets around Greenland are now beginning to melt. Uh, it'll take a long time for Greenland to melt, it'll take centuries, but they are adding considerably more water to the global ocean than they did 10 or 20 years ago, about six times as much. We know also that the Antarctic, which we always thought was very stable um, and, and even increasing in ice extent, we now know that that also is adding a lot of water to the global oceans, again, much more than we did uh, maybe 10 or 20 years ago. But nature is also telling us that the sea ice around the pole is di diminishing by about 4% per year. And this is a satellite image from last week when the sea ice for 2019 reached its minimum. And so you can see how you could sail from Sligo quite happily around the coast of Norway, around northern Siberia, all the way to Japan or China without encountering any ice around the polar extremities. And with a bit of ingenuity, you could sail from Sligo through the the Northwest Passage here, that fabled passage, all the way around to California, to southern Alaska, and to the western parts of the United States. And that is a very different situation from what applied to our forefathers. Some of them spent their life trying to find that fabled Northwest Passage. Some of them gave their life trying to find that fabled Northwest Passage. Um, this is uh, Sir John Franklin, the best known, who uh, finally perished with his three ships um, trying to find that Northwest Passage, which today is so widely open during the summer months. Um, and when they found the remains of his crew, they found that the bones had been scratched by metal implements, indicating that they had resorted to cannibalism. The hardship was such uh, that, that this was what was happening. But today, of course, you can now sail, and this is the new frontier for trade between Europe and China. 
uh, around the Northeast Passage in particular, where you can save up to $300,000 on a single trip by going that short route rather than going round the Cape of Good Hope, the Straits of Malacca, and so on. So things have, and this of course is where the battle, the battle for sovereignty is going to be in the years ahead between uh, Russia, uh, the United States, Norway, Denmark, um, and Canada, um, where potentially there are also uh, fuel and mineral resources in this very fragile environment as well. And if you're really wealthy, you can actually go on a cruise now through the Northwest Passage from New York all the way around uh, to uh, Alaska. It only costs you $26,000. Um, and I think uh, they've suspended them this year because health and safety uh, got a bit worried about what would happen to people if they got a breakdown up here in the middle of the trip. So that's what's happening. Our world is changing. And we ask the question, well, who's changing it? Who are the culprits? And if we look at the emissions of greenhouse gases according to countries, this rather distorted map is an attempt to show that, we can see who the biggest contributors are. Obviously, North America, Europe, China, and India come out uh, dominant in that map. And uh, you can see how little the global south contributes to the problem. Yet these are the people who are going to suffer most of the consequences. They won't have the resources to cope with climate change that we will in the developed world. Unless you think this little island up here is, is insignificant in that story, let me tell you that Ireland emits more greenhouse gases than the 400 million poorest people that live on this planet. That's quite a sobering statistic if you think of responsibility and global citizenship uh, in terms of what we should and shouldn't be doing. And this was brought home to me um, on a trip to Africa uh, four or five years ago. Um, I went into a little remote part of Zambia, a little village um, village hall here, uh, talked to the people about how they were coping. Uh, it was a bit like a church hall in the west of Ireland in many ways. All the men sat on one side and all the women sat on the other side. But of course I was very interested mostly in this old man here because here's where the longest memories are. And I asked him how he was coping and he told me, well he said things have been very difficult for me. I used to be able to go out and plant my seed um, and the rains would come, I would grow my corn, I would, have fam I would go out and harvest it, I would food for my family, but now I go out and I plant my seed and the rains don't come and my seed germinates and shrivels up in the dry ground. Or when I go out to harvest what's left, the rains have retreated two weeks early and I'm left with a very poor crop and I'm finding it very difficult to cope. The question on his lips was who's responsible? And, you know, I had the heart to tell him, well, it's us. It's us in the developed world who really are the major causes of those kinds of irregularities that are now emerging. I went a little further on that trip into the, into the bush to look at the famous Victoria Falls. Many of you maybe have been to Victoria Falls where the largest uh, waterfall on the continent where the Great Zambezi falls over the escarpment fills up a man-made lake called Lake Kariba, which then is used to power over 90% of the electricity needs of Zambia. Um, a huge uh, operation. This is what it looks like normally. Um, when I went, this is what it looked like. Uh, and you can see the kind of difference here right away. I mean, it was the dry season, yes. It was also one of the most severe droughts for a long time. But if you think of what was happening here, there was no water going into Lake Kariba. There was no electricity being generated. There was no power in the cities. Uh, city life had almost come to a stop because of the absence of electricity supplies. How do you manage if you're living in that kind of environment? Well, you don't need heating, obviously. You don't need electricity for that. But you do need electricity for cooking your evening meal. And your only option, really, is to get charcoal from the charcoal sellers who in turn deforest the landscape around them and the urban dwellers drag in as much as they can in terms of wood to the towns. And as with all of these environmental hazards, it's the people at the bottom, if you like, of the food chain who suffer most, who have to walk further, who have more hardship. And I show you this because it reminds us that climate change is not simply about energy, but it transcends many other aspects of life.
And that's why even in Sligo here it's important that a climate change dimension gets into all of your committees as much as possible uh, to, to emphasise that. We know, of course, that if we carry on, we're going to face big problems in terms of further heating of the globe. Um, we know also that the rainfall is going to be the key variable in many parts of the tropics. Places that don't get enough rain are going to get less. Places that get too much are probably going to get more. We know also that these place a number of different environments at acute risk and of course you'll all have been aware of the problems in sub-Saharan Africa when societal breakdown occurs when the rains fail, the social fabric begins to collapse. Another area of course is the small island states of, of, Indi of the Indian Ocean, of the Pacific Ocean, where we are effectively obliterating those cultures. Um, we're rendering them uninhabitable. We're forcing them from their homes that they've lived in and their cultures have developed in for generations and centuries. Uh, and they have not really contributed significantly to that. So here's a, here's a second critical area. And the third, of course, are the great deltas of the world. This is the Nile Delta. One of the problems with deltas is that the rivers bring the sediment to the sea and then the rivers stop. And the sediment gets dumped. And it builds up over time. And that build-up over time means that the land may subside because of the weight of sediment on top of it. So you get the land subsiding at the same time as the sea level is rising. And that's particularly severe in some parts of the world, in places like Bangladesh here, where you can see many parts of that country are less than five or six metres above sea level. That's about what we are here um, in, in this particular hotel. I show you that because here's Ireland for scale. So you're looking at a country which is maybe twice as big as Ireland. On this island we have about 6 million people. Uh, in this other place we have 160 million. Where do these people go when their land becomes uninhabitable? This is where we begin to see the problems that will emerge, which will make the Mediterranean look like very small beer indeed in the years ahead. And in fact, uh, even a one meter rise in sea level there will lose about a quarter of the country. So we're looking at very serious problems indeed in many parts of the world and also of course we know even here in Europe we're not immune from the problems of, of uh, extreme events. We had a few this summer in continental Europe and we can now um, we can now attribute some of those extreme events much more effectively to climate change than we could in the past. Five years ago, if I was asked, is this heat wave due to climate change, I would have said, no, we can't say, we can't attribute an individual event to climate change. But now we can run our climate models, not just once, but a hundred times. And we can run them maybe a thousand times, maybe 500 times with CO2 in the atmosphere at, at uh, pre-industrial levels and 500 times with CO2 in the atmosphere at current levels and say how often does this event now occur that it wouldn't have in the past and this gives us the the useful um, quality of attribution. So we can say that what happened in France this summer uh, well it was one in a thousand return period, one in a thousand year event. So that's kind of beginning to get us used to the fact that we're living in a very changing world. Even in the Middle East here, um, these purple lines here, uh, purple shading, are where the mean maximum temperature in the Arabian Peninsula uh, by 2050 will be over 57 degrees centigrade, the mean temperature uh, of each day. Now for Ireland, of course, we do follow the global trend, maybe a little behind it because of the ocean around us, but it does enable us to say, well, Ireland is ultimately going to follow the same trend as globally. And we know that even anywhere in Ireland you go today, it's half a degree warmer than it was 30 years ago. Um, whether you take any station um, and any month, you can almost find that half degree extra um, on our temperature. So we are warming up, even here in Ireland. And when we model, uh, as we have here in Maynooth, when we model the future, we can see, well, we're going to get another half degree in the next 20 years as well. So Ireland is on the way, it's on the trend for climate. T temperature will not be the critical variable for us. Temperature will be less important in Ireland than rainfall.
And the signs are we will get, unfortunately, more winter rainfall in here in the west of Ireland, where you don't really want more winter rainfall, and less summer rainfall in the east of Ireland, uh, where you don't want less summer rainfall because that's where the bulk of the population live. So we see right away a twin problem for Ireland of increased flood problems and in the west and increased drought and water supply problems in the east occurring. And we've seen some of those extremes already. Um, if you take the winter of 2013-14, that horrible winter where you had storm after storm coming across the west of Ireland, uh, it was the stormiest winter we now know in 143 years in Ireland. If you go more recently, 2015-16 was the wettest winter um, over Ireland on record for most of the country. Uh, and you'll remember those horrible scenes in the, in the Shannon Basin. And of course, uh, we have extremes that we never thought we would have of, of hu wayward hurricanes now beginning to move the wrong way across the Atlantic, uh, as we, we've seen over the past few days as well. Extremes of all kinds, even extremes of cold, uh, with Storm Emma and the beast from the east uh, a few years ago as well. And that's indicative of changes that we're doing at a larger scale. Uh, I just wanted to show you here February this year and February last year. Uh, and you may remember February this year, all oh, the daffodils were all out in Europe. It was a very mild spring this year in February. It got colder in March. Meanwhile, much of North America was freezing. Um, and it was abnormally cold there. And the previous year, we find the opposite. We've, we had a very cold uh, late spring the previous year. We actually had snow in the Sahara um, in that, in that uh, January 2018, and we had the North Pole above freezing point. So we're getting anomalies in our, in our weather, and those anomalies are really due to what's happening to our jet streams. They're becoming more erratic, not swinging around the globe here as they usually do, but becoming more erratic, giving extremes more frequently than they did before. And for Ireland, well, the prognosis then is that we, we face problems, we face changes in our habitats, uh, we face changes, for example, in our bogs, which won't like dry summers very much, we face changes in our salt marshes where we have rising sea level problems uh, and even in the, the Machair coastline of Connemara, uh, again, sea level will rise. And what about Sligo here? Um, well, what happens when species begin to want to move uphill in Ben Bulbin uh, or in um, Knocknaree? They can get up so far, but then once they get to the top, there's nowhere else for them to go. They become extinct. So we face montane difficulties as well. And of course, we face problems with uh, animals and birds as well. Many of you will have been brought up with the cry of the curlew, maybe going to the bog and hearing the curlew's very distinctive call. Well, that habitat is almost gone. Uh, and so is the curlew. We have only 150 breeding pairs left in Ireland of curlews. Um, we've lost largely the corn crake already, and there are other species like the damselfly, uh, like the arctic char, which exists in our upland lakes, which are also not going to like warmth very much as well. And at the same time, you'll be aware of how those, in, those ecological niches will be occupied by things you don't want, by invasive species like the giant rhubarb here, the gunnera, um, which... Uh, just like Japanese knotweed, is moving into those niches as climate changes as well. One of the things I've been looking at myself has been this lovely moth, um, which is um, called the horse chestnut leaf miner. And what it does is it mines into chestnut leaves and leaves them in June, looking as if they're about to fall off the tree and uh, effectively the tree becomes weakened by them. And I, I show you this because there's no way to solve this problem. Um, you'd have to burn every leaf on every tree because the moth can then uh, overwinter when the leaves fall on the ground and start the whole process again. But I show you it because this was where the moth came from way back in uh, 1984. It was first found in Macedonia. Since then, it's made its way all the way across Europe. By the end of the millennium, it was uh, at the English Channel. By the first few years of the new millennium, it has made its way across lowland England. And by the end of the first decade, it was in Hollyhead waiting for the boat. And yes, it got the boat, and it's now begun to spread eastward, westwards in Ireland. It's cropping up in the east coast now. And this is what it looks like in June. 
uh, on your chestnut trees. Now, watch out next spring for your chestnut trees and see has it made the leap to the west of Ireland. I don't think it has yet, but it's going to sooner or later. Now, what do you do about climate then at local authority level? Well, a couple of concepts are important here. The first is, um, if you're going to adapt and make changes necessary to cope with climate, you need to look at, first of all, the exposure of places. Where are the major problems and challenges going to be faced? Where are the impacts going to be felt? And then, how much capacity have you at local authority level, for example, to cope with those? And if you have very little capacity, the impacts will be big. If you have a lot of capacity, you can mitigate some of those impacts, and then your vulnerability will be diminished, and you can adapt more successfully. A number of years ago, I, I did a study, and now this is going to be dated, I'm afraid, the next few slides, but I looked at some of the problems in each county, ranking the major elements of exposure that were of concern from one to five. And uh, uh, Sligo, I think, if I can find it here, you can see Sligo comes out here uh, as a little more, if you like, vulnerable than most counties, uh, and it's particularly vulnerable in, in a couple of key areas, and those key areas are, first of all, flood events, as you might expect. Um, uh, here you can see Sligo coming out about fifth or sixth ranked in the counties of Ireland uh, for flood uh, exposure, uh, and again, because the density of population in Sligo is not as big as places like Dublin. The, the impact is, is probably less from the flood than you would get from a comparable flood in the east. The second key thing that comes out for Sligo uh, are landslides. And you can see how landslides from the National Landslides database here, Sligo comes up about third in the country for landslip hazards. So here's another area that I think needs to be looked at, especially in the planning process. Um, and third area, of course, is water supply. Um, Sligo's, you, you, we know you have problems already with water contamination, but water supply uh, is, is not particularly strong during a dry summer in Sligo uh, as well. So here, here you can see Sligo coming out. Uh, as about, again, third or fourth in the country in terms of the percentage of its water supply at risk. So these are kind of very first pass efforts uh, at looking at where the problems are going to be. Uh, biodiversity, again, uh, Sligo comes out here as not the worst county by any means, uh, but one where we have, again, obviously a lot of natural heritage areas, a lot of special areas of conservation which are going to be, uh, have to be minded very carefully in the years ahead. And of course, the, the, the action of the moment, of course, storm surges. Uh, again, you can see here Sligo coming out near the top of the table in terms of the expected increases in storm surge activity by mid-century. So here's the kind of template that we need to work with in terms of planning. Uh, how are we going to cope with sea level rise? Uh, how are we going to cope with the impacts of sea level where a county, for example, like Sligo is more exposed than most? even than the coastal counties of, of Mayo from that area. And against that, how much adaptive capacity exists? Now here, I'm going to get killed by Kieran because this is very old data from 2012, when Sligo had the sum total of two forward planning staff in its local authority. Um, <coughs> I, I think they have more now, but you can see the relative paucity of, if you like, adaptive capacity compared to some other counties that existed at that time. So when you put all that together, uh, you can then talk about vulnerability, and Sligo comes out largely because of that adaptive capacity shortfall and the other hazards that we looked at. Sligo comes out as an area where there is certainly more in terms of a vulnerability to climate change than many of the adjacent counties around it. When I did this study, I did four case studies, um, and, and Sligo, I'm afraid, wasn't one of them, but I wanted to provide each local authority with this kind of a little checklist of what, they, what the risks were, 
what the vulnerabilities were, what the adaptive capacity was. And this is the kind of thing, I think, that would guide your SPCs, would guide your PPNs in terms of making forward plans to adapt to what's coming down the road in terms of changes. So there is a kind of a, if you like, checklist that you go through. You can, first of all, collect the data, identify the local climate change issues, identify which will require a response, and then attempt to build capacity in your organisations and your local authority structures, uh, which enable you uh, to establish cross-departmental teams. And I go back to the importance now of having a climate change dimension to almost all of your SPCs. Uh, and um, uh, again, then you can start making progress in terms of building a public consensus about how to tackle some of those problems. I'm going to move on to the story internationally for a moment because I don't know how I'm doing for time. Have I got another few minutes? Yeah, okay. Um, well, a number of years ago, Ban Ki-moon, who's been very active in the global policy on climate change, came to Ireland and he, he gave us a bit of a scolding. He said, look, you've been really good in Ireland in helping the developing world. You've sent lots of money through missionaries and through charities to help people cope in the developing world uh, with, with the problems of underdevelopment. But, he said, that's no longer enough. It's no longer enough to be a leader on hunger without also being a leader on climate change. So we're seeing a convergence here between development issues and the climate change issue. And that was very well demonstrated, I suppose, when the countries of the world came together um, in Paris in 2015 to establish the Paris Agreement. Um, there had been a fiasco in Copenhagen in 2009 and so the choreography for Paris was very carefully organised by the United Nations by a pre-agreement between, uh, between uh, President Obama and Deng Xiaoping here and uh, especially also a very influential encyclical by Pope Francis, the Laudato Si, um, which is one of the most readable documents you'll find on environment and climate, um, and which has stood the test of time and will ever since. And of course, the French diplomatic system went into overdrive to ensure that uh, Paris was going to save the world, and the French were going to be striding across the global stage um, it, it, as a result of that. So all of that worked to some extent, but there were serious weaknesses in it. Um, for example, aviation and marine um, efforts were not included, emissions were not included in it, and they are very significant. Marine and aviation emissions would account for the same kind of emissions total as Germany or as South Korea. But even if you added up all the pledges countries made, they weren't going to come to a total which was sufficient to avoid that two degree value that was so important. So there was a lot of things wrong with Paris and indeed I have to say Paris is not succeeding at the moment because national self-interest is still dominant over many countries and we've seen it with uh, Brazil most recently for example. So if we don't succeed with Paris, even, even if we were to hit all of those pledges, we would still face a very difficult crash programme in emissions reduction to avoid that critical two degree value. And of course, added into the mix now, we have another complication um, which uh, has arisen since the election of uh, Donald Trump. And uh, that's proving difficult because, for example, uh, he's, he's getting allies from countries that don't want to do anything as well. I was at the UN conference in Katowice um, in December where the IPCC were presenting their 1.5 degree report and for the first time in the history of the United Nations IPCC, countries didn't welcome it. Five countries stood out as not welcoming it. The USA, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and Russia. Sorry, four countries. And that put the tone of the conference really bad for the rest of the two-week period because the UN has to agree things unanimously. So we face problems there on the international scene. And that's very unfortunate because here's what the report was saying. And the report was saying, in the next 30 years or so, we're going to pass through that critical value of, of, of 1.5 degrees of rise over pre-industrial time. Um, and that's when things begin to happen that we may not be able to recover from. 
and by me not able to recover from I mean that's because carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for centuries. So we're breathing in today the carbon dioxide that was emitted way back in the 18th and 17th centuries um, and that means that we have a finite carbon budget to burn before we hit that 1.5 or 2 degree threshold. So if we want to avoid 1.5 degrees with a 50% success rate, you can see we will burn that budget in 10 years. And when people talk about having 11 years therefore to solve this problem, that's what they mean. If you want to avoid a 50% chance of avoiding 2 degrees, you have about uh, three decades left of burn. And once that's burned, your next generation, the generation afterwards, there's no way back for them uh, from that particular problem. If we had started way back when I was beginning to work on climate change initially, we could have had a nice leisurely 3% uh, rate of diminution of our emissions, uh, but now we're going to face a problem and we're going to have to crash by uh, anything up to 10% uh, or more per year, uh, especially if we put off solving this problem for a long time. And those, those thresholds are important because somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degrees in this Paris range we will lose the coral, reefs of the coral reefs of the world. We're already seeing irreparable damage to the Great Barrier Reef. We will also begin to eat away at the um, alpine glaciers in a way they may not ever recover from. And we will see uh, the um, Arctic summer sea ice disappearing around three degrees, but starting that irrevocable retreat um, already um, uh, as we see and other things like the West Antarctic ice sheet already beginning to show signs of wearing away. So those kind of tipping thresholds are, change, are going to change our world and may not be recoverable from and of course down the road there may be even more serious ones which we haven't really uh, got a grasp of yet. And so in Ireland unfortunately but while we are supposed to and made obligations to reduce our emissions along a particular trajectory, 20% by 2020, uh, in 2008 we made that commitment, we are actually at the moment increasing our emissions. So we're going the wrong way uh, and that's, uh, that's part of the problem. So Ireland is one of the laggards as the Taoiseach has said in the problem. If you look at the league table here, we're down in 48th place. Um, well behind some of the leading countries which are actually taking action. So belatedly we have a climate action plan um, proposed by the government this summer um, and there are some re really good things in it. Um, the governance aspects, the political aspects are very positive um, in, the, in, in some of these plans but there are negative aspects as well in that the plan if it works will achieve a 2% reduction per year up to 2030 and that simply is not cutting the mustard. But are Irish, is Irish society ready for the consequences of actually tackling this problem? Because here's really what it entails. It entails, first of all, we have to come to terms with our agricultural systems um, as major pollutants. We have to come to terms with more in the way of wind tur turbines. Uh, the plan is for almost uh, 900,000 electric vehicles, cars and vans. We're banning petrol diesel vehicles within 12 years, 11 years. We're, ban we're having, expecting to go through 45,000 deep retrofits each year, which is very ambitious. 600,000 heat pumps uh, by 2030, which again is very ambitious, and afforestation to get rid of our emissions. Well, even with the best will in the world, that's not going to work sufficiently uh, without foresting half the landscape of Ireland, really. So we have problems. We have also some positive news here, in that Ireland was the first country in the world to divest its sovereign wealth fund out of fossil fuel investments. And that was as a result of very active NGO pressures, which came from faith communities, NGOs, foundations, trusts, and so on. So uh, Ireland achieved that uh, as part of a global divestment process, which is going on now, where a lot of money is now being taken out of unit trust funds, of investment funds, by individuals and also by, uh, by companies. Uh, when you see, for example, here, 
the Rockefellers divesting, you begin to think, well, this is serious stuff if you think what they made their money on. Um, and this is a process which is accelerating. There's a legal process also accelerating, again, partly driven by young people. Um, lots and lots of cases around the world taking place, some of them very successful, as in Holland here. And ultimately, this is the target audience that we have to remember going back to, because this is the person who will suffer if we don't succeed in tackling this problem. So, here's the IPCC report. Every action matters, every bit of warming matters, every year matters, and every choice matters. So, really it's up to us, but it's up to us in conjunction with leadership from our political decision makers, from our masters, if you like, uh, that we have to act together to solve this problem. Otherwise, we face the difficulties of uh, a world which is not going to be sustainable. So what you're doing here tonight is something that's very laudable. I think you're, you're a committed audience which knows where we have to go. And I'd urge you to take the steps now in terms of organizing your local authority, organizing your national leaders, of the urgency of this problem because for your children, for your grandchildren's sake, you want to give them options in the future which otherwise they won't have. Thank you very much indeed.